Hello and welcome to this week's HR Uprising podcast on the topic of rethinking culture. So as part of our rethinking series, um, we've covered a number of things, things, I thought I'd focus in on how we could consider what our culture looks like in our organisations and if we want to rethink it, what we might do to do so. And as part of my research for this particular topic, I, in fact, this some of this goes back to when I was writing my book, um, called How to Be a Change Superhero, if you haven't come across it, where I was talking about change and culture change in that. Um, I did do some research into various cultural models, and some of them are easier to visualise. So therefore, if you're listening to the podcast in a normal way, just through audio, and you're trying to picture the models that I'm talking about, you can go and view them on YouTube, because I've decided to do this as a video as well, and I'll also put a link to the slides if you want to access them in the show notes so you can download them and look at them. So hopefully that's useful for you. So really, in principle, what I want to cover um, within this session is a little bit about how do we diagnose culture. Um, I'm then going to run through some different models that you could use as part of your organisational diagnosis, how you might design, uh, define what your current culture is, the as is state, and also the to be state if you're trying to do change. I'm not going to go into how to change as much on this because I'll do that in future episodes and I have done it in previous episodes as well. But certainly it's about how can you align culture with strategy and how to avoid culture change failing, basically. So if we start off with how we might define culture, I mean, it's a pretty tricky topic to define in many ways. There are some really lengthy definitions. I'll give you a moment if you think about how you might define it yourself. Um, Spencer Oti and Franklin in 2009 defined it as a fuzzy set of basic assumptions and values, orientations to life beliefs, policies, procedures, and behavioral conventions that are shared by a group of people and that influence but do not determine each member's behaviour and his or her interpretations of the meaning of other people's behaviour. So that's quite a wordy definition that we have here. Or the more classically shared one is how we do things around here, which comes down to Charles Handy, the sort of grandfather of organisational development. So culture is how we do things about here. It's just sort of, it's almost a feeling. It's just what happens. And it's not necessarily the same as what the stated culture is. And this is what we are exploring, I guess, in this concept of rethinking culture. Is our culture working for us? Is our culture aligned with strategy? A question that I've been asked is, um, does strategy align with culture or should culture align with strategy? And I think the great Peter Drucker quote, which is, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast, kind of answers that question. The bottom line is, much as we might want strategy to be the driver, fundamentally, culture is going to be stronger unless it's aligned. Or more importantly, I guess, if you can align your culture with your strategy, you're much more likely to achieve it. So thinking about how you might define your own organisational structure, um, structure culture, sorry, um, there are a few different models that are really useful to look at here. The first one um, I'm going to outline is called the Competing Values Framework by Cameron and Quinn. So to help you picture this, this is a four box framework and there are two axes. You've got the upright axes, which is flexible versus stable. So it basically represents the tension between the need for an organization to be adaptable, innovative and responsive to change. So flexibility versus the need for it to be stable, controlled and consistent. So stability. So you can probably already think about whether your organization is more flexible or more stable. So flexible is at the top, stability is at the bottom. And then the other axis is basically internal versus external focus. So internal is on the left and external is on the right. And this is more about the difference between focusing on internal processes, uh, cohesion, integration, so internal focus versus competition, marketplace, market dynamics, customers, external focus. So with those two axes, you can imagine that you've then got four different boxes that you could pop your culture into, in, in, if you like. And of course, Lots of us will have varying cultures and lots of organisations have multiple cultures, uh, so you can be aware of those. However, if we just simply, simply 
define it like this, you can then use this to maybe diagnose where you think your organisation is and think, does this fit with where we need to be? So if you are flexible and internal focused, then it, the focus is more collaborative. And the shortcut name for this on this framework is known as a clan. So if you have this clan focus, you would prioritize things like teamwork, employee development, consensus building. You might have a family-like culture where loyalty and cohesion is really highly valued. And that can be fantastic. Although as a clan type culture grows, for example, sometimes you might find that that outgrows say the organization, people don't feel that uh, decisions are made collaboratively. They may see that they're made in a pocket um, and not cascaded or people are not involved. So that all of these things you can maybe, it's whether they're fit for the time or the strategy that you are. So there's disadvantages to every type as well in principle. The second type, which is where you're flexible, but externally focused is more of a create or ad hocracy culture. So a culture here is where you're going to prioritize innovation, entrepreneurship, risk taking. You'd be dynamic, adaptive and have that sort of creative entrepreneurial spirit. And you see where that's going to work as well. So often flexible. I often see those might be with smaller, newer businesses It's to make to maintain something like that. Uh, can you do that in this larger, maybe we've heard a place like um, Google or Apple in principle, might have that kind of um, that kind of approach. But then you might have become more competitive in the market and uh, we've got to be more driven. So it's more external, but needs to be more stable. So in that situation, it would be com compete or market. And this is where the company would prioritize achievement, market success, competition, very results oriented and performance driven and focus on achieving goals in a competitive environment. So maybe as a an hadocracy matures and the market becomes more competitive, that's where um, you have to move to strategically to be able to drive there. And then finally, you've got your control oriented, which is stable and internal facing. Um, and that would be more hierarchical. So for me, this would be often large firms, definitely public sector, thinking NHS, those sort of things. And you, know, you prioritize efficiency, consistency and control. Of course, sometimes you need to be more market driven or more flexible, but that's really tricky if you set up to be more of a control culture. So clear structures, rules, processes, all about stability and coordination, and getting those efficiency. And I guess if those processes aren't there, um, then it becomes an issue, you're less efficient or you could become overly bureaucratic and it becomes very, very slow to make decisions. So there are pros and cons of all of them. But if you wanted to use this tool, it can be a really useful way of, you can actually, there's a questionnaire actually that you can access. I'll put the link for that in the show notes as well, um, where you could actually um, get your leadership team, for example, to answer the questionnaire and think, where is it that we are? And then think about, does this fit with our strategy or where we want to go? So you can analyze it. You might identify that you've got strengths or weaknesses associated with that type of um culture if you like and maybe you can see whether or not you want to adapt your leadership styles and competencies and i'll come on to that further in terms of how you might think it works i would think that if you're collaborative the collaborate clan one it is more about a long-term development approach creative is more breaking through maybe breaking into new markets compete is short-term rapid performance getting there first um, and control would be more about incremental improvement. But fundamentally, all of them have value. And maybe we might want to work out ways of combining the best parts of them. But it's it's kind of a, a management approach. So thinking about how are the line managers approach within this? And also think about when you're recruiting people, will they fit within the style um, that you have in terms of theirs? This is competing values. So basically, each of those, we're saying those values, whether it's collaborate, create, control or compete, um, are competing with each other as well. And you have to think about which is right for you and your organisation right now. So that's the competing values framework by Cameron and Quinn. Um, and you can get this if you want to Google the organisational culture assessment instrument, OCAI, then you can Google that. And that's the, the questionnaire that you can use to to examine it. Then moving on to two other um, models. The first one is probably quite easy to visualize and it's a simple uh, model called the Culture Onion by Edgar Schein. And I think this is 50s or 60s. 
Now, I have done a variation on this because he talked about three layers to the cultural onion. So if you visualize three concentric circles inside each other, um, on the outside, the furthest outside one is visible artifact facts. The second one is espoused values. And the third one is underlying assumptions. Now, in my visuals, and as I did this in the book, I've actually added in a fourth one between the espoused values and the underlying assumptions, and I've called it leadership behaviours. And it's my belief that that actually is quite key in terms of culture, because so much of culture is driven by leadership and management behaviours. So explaining what these all stand for and mean, so you can think about this in relation to your organisation. So the outside is the visible artefacts, and it represents the visible things of the culture that you can see. So whether it's a physical environment, things like dress codes, symbols, rituals, ceremonies, um, they're easy to see, but they might not necessarily represent the values and assumptions of the organization. So they could be misleading um, or they, they, they could be aligned, right? Uh, and often you do see with these that people or companies might think actually by changing this, let's say we want to be young and funky, we're going to put some um, bean bags in our uh, the whole you know our hallway and pool tables and things to give this sort of uh, impression. Yet when we went further inside, the leadership behaviors underlying assumptions are still old and stayed. The visible artifacts, it's not going to make a difference, basically. That's the thing. So you're kind of moving things around the surface, but that's not a way to make change. They're more of an indication of the culture, usually, or desired culture, maybe. Then you've got your espoused values. So this also, it's because it's espoused, it's what you're saying. So it only really works as representative of the culture if they are the beliefs, values and norms that people who are within the organisation, particularly the leaders, actually demonstrate. So you may have them you know, articulated in your mission statement with slogans or documents. However, if, for example, you say your mission statement, we're all about people, we're all about well-being. Yet when you come internally, you notice that people are rewarded for working extremely long hours or there's an expectation that people will work on a weekend. Then you can see this again, the underlying assumptions or leadership behaviours are going to actually undermine those espoused values. Underlying assumptions, as I said, the, um, that, this is Edgar Shines, is that's your most innermost. But for me, leadership behaviours, I'll come back to further. But it absolutely is whether people are walking these values, modelling these values, because that makes a difference between what your underlying assumptions are. So this underlying assumptions is the, the deepest level of the organisational culture, basically. Uh, it's the unconscious, so it's not necessarily unconscious, unconscious beliefs, perceptions, and attitudes that are shared by people in the organization. So sometimes they're going to be, people will just take them for granted um, and people don't even speak about them. They're not explicit, they're just kind of inferred. It's how things are done. So people are unaware of them, which is really weird because it's an assumption there. And Shine just basically says that these sort of things are really key. If you don't understand those, you can't really change culture unless you get underneath these underlying assumptions. And for me, certainly, if you're talking to your leaders and managers and the people, what their underlying assumptions are, I'll come on to that as to how you can explore those things. That's the way in which you're going to be able to unlock change that you might be wanting to achieve. Then my third model, which I particularly, I think is my favourite because I think it's the most pragmatic. And again, you can download um, a template of this if you wanted to do it with your organisation. It's called the Cultural Web by Gary Johnson and Kevin Scholes in their book, Exploring Corporate Strategy, which was 1984 when they first published it. So they uh, basically talk, there are, they talk about your organizational paradigm, but essentially there are seven parts to this web. And this concept of web is that you know, culture, it's not linear, it is a web, it's a mesh. And that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? So in my visual that I'm looking at on the screen, we might talk about an organisational paradigm, which is sort of the mindset of the organisation, how the organisation wants to see itself or, or sees itself. And then around that paradigm are these other supporting areas. And those are the organisational structures, control systems, power structures, symbols, stories and myths and rituals and routines. And let me explain what I mean by which so some of them are self-explanatory. So if you talk about something like the organisational structure, well, obviously that is your hierarchy, um, 
uh, you know, the formal reporting lines in the organisation, who do you report into and the division of responsibility. So that's your structure and, you know, titles and things like that will kind of come into that, although those link also to symbols and power structures, hence the web. So you know what your structure's like. So that's going to affect things. Yeah, you know, decision making is going to be a lot slower in a highly hierarchical organisation with lots of um, pieces to go through. You've also got the power structure, which is going to be linked probably to your organisational structure. But you can have formal and informal power, can't you? Are there pockets of influencers who stop things from happening? You know, things like trade unions will make a difference to a culture of something. If you've always got to get something past someone or is the power, are they very empowered? Or are you an organisation where one person makes all the decisions? And if you get them on board, then the power, you're off. So that will make a massive difference to the culture that's realistic for to operate. Um, within your business. Control systems, those are things like policies and procedures, performance management systems, reward structures, um, expenses, who signs off expenses, those sort of things will also impact on it. So if you want to be fast and moving um, and you go, yeah, we're going to go and compete in the marketplace, but let's say you've got a massively complex sign off for the basic expenses. So people can't do think something that they feel really is quite minimal, then that's going to set a much more of an autocratic feel. People are not going to feel empowered, slows things down. It doesn't really fit with going out there and people being entrepreneurial and taking risks out there. So if you've got these systems and processes in place, which, you know, let's face it, you might need to have if you're in, a, in certain organisations, um, you're thinking NHS again or those sort of things, you've got to have control systems in place. It's quite tricky. You've got to how to get that balance. It's got to align with the sort of organisation you are and the markets you operate in. Uh, things like rituals and routines, they are similar to ones we talked about earlier in terms of the symbols, same as symbols as we talked about with Edgar Schein. So regular act um, activities and procedures that reinforce cultural norms. They could be things like, uh, do you have regular team meetings face to face does everyone go down the pub on a friday um you know that and those things can have a an impact do people have lunch together or do people eat at their desk those sort of behaviors and what what's a normal behavior will um affect the culture for people for good or for bad and, and actually something like going down the pub on the friday could be brilliant for people feeling collaborative and teamwork but it could also make certain people feel left out Stories and myths, that's a quite a fun one in terms of um, the, the things that pervade around an organisation. Uh, the story that I always remember is the company that I used to work for. The classic uh, anecdote was that the FD was standing looking out of the window in the offices and he said, oh, there is our company's greatest asset um, to someone standing by him. And the person said, oh, well, our people. Um, and bear in mind, this is a company who one of their values was um, valuing our people. And he said, no, 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 it's the company car fleet. Uh, now, I'll never know if that was actually true, but it was definitely, definitely a story of myth. Of its own, and, but that was indicative of the culture of this organisation, which espoused value was all about people. But fundamentally, it came down to the nuts and bolts, the P&L and those numbers. So the cultural web, what's, what I like to do with this is if you are looking to change your culture or to define your culture, and you might have done, you could use this in conjunction with the Cameron and Quinn values framework, then you can actually set up a sort of, you could diagnose your own culture. You could get the seven types um, and put a definition in down the left um, of what we are currently. So an as is. So for example, you might have an organizational paradigm of we're currently financially stable, trustworthy, quality and research driven. And then you might define what do we want the to be to be. So we want to be innovative, we want to be responsive and customer focused. So you can see basically that is trying to switch the focus from being as internally focused to being more externally focused. And you can do the same for all of that. Can have think, what are our organizational structures, control systems, power structures, etc.? What are our as is examples? Work with other people, ask other people what they think, and then think what do we want our to be to be. And then what we're doing is really you're defining what you want the culture change to be. And then of course you can um, start to make the change, which is a topic for another podcast or webinar. So you've got your as is, you've got your to be. What can you do next in terms of these type of things? How can you um, assess your as is? Because sometimes you won't know off the top of your head how it is. Well, the sorts of things you can do, you can um, use surveys. 
and questionnaires because it's really useful to get people out you might kind of evolve others what do they think our culture is what do you think our norms are what symbols do we have that that summarize us as a business um, you can check those for consistency see if people come back with the same things on a regular basis um, do you have a company mission do people believe in it does it make sense do they align with it uh, you could use some some focus groups, ask them open questions about you know, what they see the culture as being and see whether the same words come up time and time again. So you can sort of cluster those words. You can do cultural audits. So a cultural audit would be an example like the, uh, of the survey that I talked about earlier. Um, you could potentially benchmark your organisation. If you're in a larger industry, there is benchmarking available. So perhaps go out and see it as um, cultural benchmarking. Although I have to say, considering we work with lots and lots of different businesses, it's amazing. You can have two businesses in exactly the same um, industry, same size and culturally being absolutely worlds apart. And the difference for me is almost always leadership um, behaviours. And that's where one of the most practical tools you can use if you really want to align is use a tool like 360 Feedback. And quick plug, you, if you haven't got a 360 Feedback tool, Actus 360 Now is a fantastic 360 tool if you wanted to use it. You could put your organisational values in and then you could assess your leadership or your management team against that. Um, and then you can have a view at an overall organisation as to whether or not the degree to which you are consistent or the behaviours of your leaders are considered to be consistent with your espoused values, where the gaps are, what the comments are that people say about it, or you might find certain teams are and certain teams aren't. So that can be a really powerful way of diagnosing your culture, your leadership culture and your alignment. So those are tools that I would use if I wanted to get really good different definition. And if we think about being evidence based, we know it's all about defining to start with, assessing where we are to start with, then defining our culture. Then what you need to do basically is having defined our clear as is and to be, we want to make sure that we get leaders bought into it. This culture change is going to start from the top. We want to make sure that our leaders are really committed to the desired culture. Um, they're walking their talk most basically. Um, and role models. We need to be able to communicate things as well transparently so people can ask about it. And that means we need to involve employees because ultimately the culture is what we do. It's how we are around here. So you can't just do it by telling a small pocket of people. So involve our employees. It's empower them to take part, to compete, to um, feedback, give training and development if we need to have specific skills that are going to make us able to survive in a new cultural um, environment. For example, so if we're going to become more process driven, make sure people understand how to do these processes, make sure they know why those processes are there. Then we need to recognise people, reward them for making their change. And also, don't forget, make sure your structures and processes align. And that, for me, is one of the key where I've seen it. I've worked for an organisation that had come around through um, a merger it had bought other businesses and it's almost like they, they moved too quickly, kept buying things, and people would still refer to the old company. And things, silly things like there was still um, paperwork stationery around the office that had the old company logo on it. So those sort of things pull you back from changing that, moving into change here. So making sure that you, you align your structure and processes with the new way and embed those, because those are reasons why culture change doesn't work. So if you have things that are sort of pulling you back away from the change. So that's my summary on rethinking culture. If you wanted to rethink your culture and your organisation, think about where are you currently, to be honest, and then decide, is it serving me? And you can use the tools that we've shared, whether it's the um, Cameron and Quinn model, competing values framework, whether it's cultural web, you can use that for some diagnosis. There are other tools you can use, surveys, 360 feedback to get that information. Um, and then once you work out where you want to be, make sure your leaders are on board with you. It is, remember, culture does not change overnight. It is something that takes a while and then suddenly you wake up and realise it's happened. Uh, so it's not something that you can just, just snap your fingers and tell people to change. It's got to be a really good concerted approach to doing that change. And I will. I have done other um, episodes on change, so hopefully, obviously, you can go back to those sorts of things. But if you want to do more about delivering culture change, I highly recommend you look at the content I've done on um, Cotter's work, so about organisational change. 
So I really hope that that's um, been of interest and useful to you. Thank you so much for joining me on the HR Uprising this week.